We are continuing the course on, on infectious pathology and we'll be talking about uh, inflammatory responses to infection today. In, cost, in contrast with the vast molecular diversity of microbes, the morphological patterns of tissue responses to microbes are limited, as are the mechanisms directing these responses. Therefore, many pathogens produce similar reaction patterns and few features are unique to or pathognomic for a particular microorganism, adding to the challenge in uh, histopathologic diagnosis. The interaction between, between the microbe and the host determines the histologic features of the response to the microbes. There are five major histologic patterns of tissue reaction in infections. Suppurative, mononuclear, also known as granuloma, granulomators, uh, cytopathic, cytoproliferative, uh, necrosis and chronic inflammation and scarring. Uh, Suppurative inflammation we discussed earlier. Uh, we'll look um, a bit at mononuclear and, and granulomatous inflammation. Diffuse, predominantly mononuclear interstitial infiltrates are a common feature of all chronic inflammatory processes, but sometimes they appear acutely in response to viruses, intracellular bacteria or intracellular parasites. In addition, uh, spirochetes and some helminths also provoke chronic inflammation, as anophilia can be prominent with some helminthic infections. Which mononuclear cell predominates within the inflammatory lesion depends on the host immune response to the organism. Therefore, lymphocytes predominate in hepatitis B virus infection, and you see this on the left picture shown by the arrows. Plasma cells are common in the primary and secondary lesions in syphilis, shown on the picture on the right, also with the arrows. This, uh, the presence of these lymphoid cells reflect cell-mediated immune responses against the pathogen or pathogen-infected cells. Granulomatous inflammation is a, is a distinctive form of mononuclear inflammation, usually evoked by infectious agents that resist eradication, but nevertheless are capable of stimulating strong T-cell-mediated immunity. Uh, as in cases of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Histoplasma capsulatum, and uh, Schistosomax. Granulomatose inflammation is characterized by accumulation of activated macrophages called epithelioid cells, which may fuse to form giant cells, as you can see on, on the slide. And in some cases, there is a central area of caseous necrosis. Cytopathic or cytoproliferative reaction usually is produced by viruses. The lesions are characterized by cell necrosis or cellular proliferation, usually with sparse inflammatory cells. Some viruses replicate within cells and make viral aggregates that are visible as inclusion bodies, as on the picture on the left shown by the arrow. Or also they induce cells to fuse and form multinucleated cells, as on the picture on the right, called polycarions, um, as in cases with a measles virus or herpes viruses. Focal cell damage in the skin may cause epithelial cells to become detached, forming blisters. Some viruses can cause epithelial cells to proliferate as in cases of venereal warts caused by HPV of the um, umbilicated papules of molluscum contagiosum caused by pox viruses. Finally, viruses can contribute to the development of malignant neoplasms. Um, the tissue necrosis is another reaction. Uh, Tritium, perfringens, and other organisms that secrete powerful toxins can cause such rapid and severe necrosis that tissue that damages tissues, and this becomes a dominant feature. 
Because few inflammatory cells are present, necrotic lesions resemble infarcts with disruption or loss of basophilic nucleostaining and preservation of cellular outlines. Clostridia, as on the picture on the left, often are opportunistic pathogen uh, that is introduced into muscle tissue by penetrating trauma or infection of the bowel in a neutropenic host. Similarly, the parasite Entamoeba histolytica causes colonic ulcers and liver abscesses characterized by extensive tissue destruction and liquefactive necrosis without a prominent inflammatory infiltrate, as shown on the picture in the middle. By entirely different mechanisms, viruses can cause widespread necrosis of host cells associated with inflammation, as exemplified by destruction of the temporal lobes of the brain by herpes simplex encephalitis, as on the picture on the right, or the liver uh, <coughs> destruction by hepatitis B virus. The powerful exotoxins of uh, C. diphtheria cause necrosis of laryngeal epithelium, giving rise to pseudomembrane comprised of necrotic cells enmeshed in a fibrinous exudate. And this also can cause asphyxia. Uh, chronic inflammation and scarring is uh, another mechanism, and many infections elicit chronic inflammation, which can either resolve with complete healing or lead to extensive scarring. Sometimes an exuberant scarring response is the major cause of dysfunction. For example, uh, schistosome eggs cause a pipe stem fibrosis of the liver or fibrosis of the bladder wall. As you can see on the picture, uh, you see schistosoma hematobium infection of the bladder with numerous calcified eggs and extensive scarring. Amicobacterium tuberculosis uh, causes constructive fibrous pericarditis. Chronic hepatitis B virus infection may cause uh, cirrhosis of the liver in which dense uh, fibrous septa surround nodules of regenerating hepatocytes. Um, viral infections are the most common cause of uh, myocarditis uh, with Coxsackie viruses A and B and other interviruses accounting for a majority of the cases. Uh, cytomegalovirus, um, human immunodeficiency virus, influenza virus, and others are less common pathogens. Offending agents can be identified by serologic studies that show rising antibody titers or through molecular diagnostic techniques using infected tissues. While some viruses can cause direct cell death, in most cases the injury results from an immune response directed against virally infected cells. This is analogous to the damage inflicted by virus-specific T cells on hepatitis virus-infected liver cells. In some cases, viruses trigger reaction against cross-reacting proteins, such as myosin hep chain. The non-viral infectious cases, um, I'm sorry, the non-viral infections causes of microdisease run the entire gamut of the microbial world. The protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi is the agent of uh, Chagas disease. Although uncommon in the northern hemisphere, this disease affects up to one of the half of population in endemic areas of South America with myocardial involvement in the vast majority. About 10% of the patients die during an acute attack. Others can enter chronic immune-mediated phase with development of progressive signs of chronic heart failure and arrhythmia 10 to 20 years later. Toxoplasma gondii, um, household cats, are often the most common vector also can cause my myocarditis, particularly in immunocompromised individuals. In acute myocarditis, um, the heart may appear normal or dilated. In advanced stages, the myocardium typically is flabby and often mottled, 
with pale and hemorrhagic areas. Mural thrombi may be present. Microscopically, myocarditis is characterized by edema, interstitial inflammatory lymphoid infiltrates, as shown on, on the picture on the layer left by an arrow, as well as uh, myocyte injury. If the patient survives the acute phase of myocarditis, uh, lesions may resolve without significant secular or heal by progressive <coughs> fibrosis. In hypersensitivity myocarditis, interstitial and perivascular infiltrates are composed of lymphocytes, macrophages, and a high proportion of eosinophils, as shown on the picture on the right by the arrow. Giant cell myocarditis is a morphologically distinctive entity characterized by widespread inflammatory cell infiltrates containing multinucleate giant cells formed by macrophage fusion. Giant cell myocarditis probably represent um, the aggressive end of the spectrum of lymphotic myocarditis and there is at least focal and frequently extensive necrosis. Um, on the picture on the left, you can see giant cell myocarditis with lymphocyte and macrophage infiltrates, extensive myocyte damage and multinucleate giant cells shown by the yellow arrow. Um, this um, variant of myocarditis, a giant cell myocarditis, carries a poor prognosis. Chagas myocarditis is characterized by the parasitization of scattered myofibers by trypanosomes, uh, as shown on the picture on the right, accompanied by an inflammatory, inflammatory infiltrate of neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, and occasional eosinophils. Pulmonary infection in the form of pneumonia is responsible for one-sixth of all deaths in the United States. Pneumonia can be broadly defined as any infection in the lung. Normally, the lung parenchyma remains sterile because of a number of highly effective immune and non-immune defense mechanisms that extend throughout the respiratory system from the nasopharynx to the alveolar spaces, as shown on the picture. The vulnerability of the lung to infection despite these defenses is not surprising because uh, many microbes are airborne and readily inhaled into the lungs. Nasopharyngeal flora are regularly aspirated during sleep, even by healthy individuals, and lung diseases often lower local immune defenses. The importance of immune defenses in preventing pulmonary infections is emphasized by patients with inherited or acquired defects in innate immunity, including neutrophil and complement defects, or adaptive immunity as humor in humoral immunodeficiency, all of which lead to an increased incidence of infections with pyogenic bacteria. For example, patients with mutations in MYD88, an adapter protein required for signaling by toll-like receptors, are extremely susceptible to severe necrotizing pneumococcal infection, while patients with congenital defects in immunoglobulin A production, um, which is uh, the major immunoglobulin in, in the air secretion, are at increased risk for pneumonias caused by encapsulated organisms such as pneumococcus and um, H. influenza. On the other hand, uh, defects in Th1 cell-mediated immunity lead mainly to increased infections with intracellular microbes such as atypical micro mycobacteria. Much more commonly, lifestyle choices interfere with host immune defense mechanisms and facilitate infections. For example, cigarette smoke compromises mucociliary clearance and pulmonary macrophage activity and alcohol impairs neutrophil function, as well as cough and epiglottic reflexes, thereby increasing the risk of aspiration. Bacterial pneumonias are classified according to the specific etiologic agent 
or if known pathogen can be isolated by the clinical setting in which the infection occurs. Altogether, seven distinct clinical settings are recognized, each associated with a fairly distinct group of pathogens. Community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, community-acquired viral pneumonia, nos nosocomial pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, chronic pneumonia, necrotizing pneumonia, and lung abscess. Pneumonia in the immunocompromised host and uh, consideration of the clinical settings can be a helpful guide when antimicrobial therapy has to be given empirically. Um, bacterial pneumonias often follow a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Streptococcus pneumonia, um, the pneumococcus, is the most common cause of community-acquired acute pneumonia, as shown on the picture, and is discussed first, followed by other relatively common pathogens. Pneumococcal infections occur with increased frequency in two clinical settings. Uh, chronic diseases such as chronic heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or diabetes, and congenital or acquired defects in immunoglobulin production, as in cases of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Decreased or absent splenic function, uh, as in cases of sickle cell disease or after splenectomy, they all greatly, all greatly increase the risk for overwhelming pneumococcal sepsis. You will recall that the spleen contains the largest collections, uh, collection of phagocytes in the body and is the major organ responsible for removing pneumococci from the blood. The spleen also is an important site for production of antibodies against polysaccharides, which are the dominant protective antibodies against encapsulated bacteria. The pre presence of numerous neutrophils in sputum containing the typical gram-positive lancet-shaped diplococci supports um, the diagnosis of pneumococcal pneumonia, but it must be remembered that streptococcus pneumonia is a part of the endogenous flora in 20% of adults and therefore false positive results may be obtained. Isolation of pneumococci from blood cultures is more specific but less sensitive. In the early phase of illness, only 20 to 30% of patients have positive blood cultures. Pneumococcal vaccines containing capsular polysaccharides from the common serotypes are used in individuals at high risk for pneumococcal sepsis. On the left and middle picture, you see an acute bronchopneumonia. On the picture on the right, severe alveolar edema um, with um, a picture in, uh, with an asterisk. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus is an important cause of secondary bacterial pneumonia in children and healthy adults after viral respiratory illnesses, as in measles in children and influenza in both children and adults. Staphylococcal pneumonia is associated with a high incident of complications such as lung abscess or empyema. Staphylococcal pneumonia occurring in association with right-sided staphylococcal endocarditis is a serious complication of intravenous drug abuse. It is also an important cause of nosocomial pneumonia shown on the picture. Bacterial pneumonia has two patterns of anatomic distribution, lobular bronchopneumonia and lobular pneumonia. In the context of pneumonias, the term consolidation used frequently refers to solid solidification of the lung due to the replacement of the air, the air by exudate in the alveoli. Patchy consolidation of the lung is the dominant characteristic of bronchopneumonia, while consolidation of a large portion of a lobe or entire lobe defines loba pneumonia. This anatomic categorization may be difficult to apply in individual cases because patterns overlap and patchy involvement may evolve to become confluent over time, producing complete lobar consolidation. 
Moreover, the same organisms may produce either pattern depending on patient susceptibility. Most important from the clinical standpoint are identification of the causative agent and determination of the extent of disease. In lobal pneumonia, four stages of the inflammatory response have classically been described. In the first stage of congestion, the lung is heavy, boggy and red. It is characterized by vascular engorgement, intraalveolar fluid with few neutrophils and often the presence of numerous bacteria. The stage of red hepatitization that follows is characterized by massive confluent exudation as neutrophils, red cells and fibrin fill the alveolar spaces, as on the picture on the left. Uh, during the gross examination, the lobe is red, firm and airless with a liver-like consistency, hence the term hepatization. The stage of gray hepatization that follows is marked by progressive disintegration of red cells and the persistence of um, fibrinous superative exudate, as shown uh, on the picture in the middle, that results in a color change to grayish brown. In the final stage of resolution, the exudate within the alveolar spaces is broken down by enzy enzymatic digestion to produce granular, granular semi-fluid debris that is resorbed, ingested by macrophages, expectorated or organized by fibroblasts growing into shown uh, on the picture on the right by the arrows. Plural uh, Fibrinous reaction to the underlying inflammation is often present in the early stages as the consolidation extends uh, to the surface. This process is known as pleuritis. It may resolve to or undergo organization, uh, leaving fibrous thickening or permanent adhesions. Foci of bronchopneumonia are consolidated areas of acute superative inflammation. The consolidation may be confined to one lobe, but is more often multilobar and frequently bilateral and basal because of the tendency of secretions to gravity to the lower lobes. Well-developed lesions are slightly elevated, dry, granular, gray-red to yellow, and poorly delimited in their margins. Histologically, a neutrophil-rich exudate fills the bronchi, bronchioles and adjacent alveolar spaces, as shown on the picture. The major symptoms um, of typical community-acquired acute bacterial pneumonia are abrupt onset of high fever, shaking chills and cough producing mucopurulent sputum. Occasional patients have hemoptysis. Diseases. When pleuritis is present, it is accompanied by a pleuritic pain and pleural friction rub. The whole lobe is radio, ra, radiopaque in lobular pneumonia, whereas there are focal opacities in bronchopneumonia as shown on the picture. The clinical picture is markedly modified by the administration of effective antibiotics. <laughs> Treated patients may be relatively uh, febrile with few clinical signs 48 to 70 hours after the initiation of the antibiotics. The identification of the organism and the determination of its um, antibiotic sensitivity are the keystones of the therapy. Less than 10 patients with pneumonia severe enough to merit hospitalization now succumb and in most such instances death results from a complication such as empyema, meningitis, endocarditis or pericarditis or to some predisposing influence such as debility or chronic alcoholism. The most common causes of community-acquired uh, viral pneumonias are influenza type A and B, the respiratory uh, 
syncytal virus, um, syncytial viruses, human metapneumovirus, adenovirus, uh, rhinoviruses, rubeola virus, and varicella virus. Nearly all of these agents also cause upper respiratory tract infections, um, known as a common cold. These pathologic viruses share propensity to infect and damage respiratory epithelium, producing an inflammatory response. When the process extends to alveoli, there is usually interstitial inflammation, but some outpouring of fluid into alveolar space may also occur so that on the chest films the changes may mimic those of bacterial pneumonia. As a result, it is not possible to distinguish bacterial and viral pneumonia based on radiologic appearance alone. Moreover, damage leading to necrosis of the respiratory epithelium inhibits mucociliary clearance and predisposes to secondary bacterial infections. Such serious complications of viral infection are more likely in infants, older adults, malnourished patients, alcoholics, and immunosuppressed individuals. The morphologic patterns in viral pneumonias are similar. The process may be patchy, um, or it may involve whole lobes bilaterally or unilaterally, macroscopically. The affected areas are red-blue, congested and subcrepitant. On histologic examination, the inflammatory reaction is largely confined to the walls of the alveoli. On the picture, you see the fecund alveolar walls that are infiltrated with lymphocytes and some plasma cells, which are spilling over into alveolar space. Note the focal alveolar edema shown in the center and early fibrosis in the upper right part of the picture. The septa widened and edematose. They usually contain a mononuclear inflammatory infiltrate of lymph uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, and occasionally plasma cells. In the classic case, alveolar spaces in viral pneumonia are free of cellular exudate. In severe cases, however, full-blown diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes may develop. In less severe, uncomplicated cases, subs uh, subsidence of the disease is followed by reconstitution of the normal architecture. Superimposed bacterial infection are expected results in, and it results in a mixed histologic picture. The clinical course of viral pneumonia is extremely varied. It may masquerade as a severe upper respiratory tract infection or chest cold that goes undiagnosed or manifest as a fulminant life-threatening infection in immunocompromised patients. The initial presentation usually is that of an acute non-specific febrile illness characterized by fever, headache and malaise and later cough with minimal sputum. The localization of the inflammatory exudate to the alveolar walls prevents oxygenation of blood flowing through the affected air spaces, which in turn causes mismatch of ventilation and perfusion. As a result, the degree of respiratory distress often seems out of proportion to the physical and radiographic findings. Identifying the causative agent can be difficult. Um, as pneumonia, the pneumococcus is the most common cause of community-acquired bacterial pneumonia and usually has a lobar pattern of involvement. Morphologically, lobar pneumonias evolve through four stages, congestion, red hepatization, gray hepatization and resolution. Viral pneumonias are characterized by respiratory distress out of proportion 
to the clinical and radiological signs and by inflammation that is predominantly confined to alveolar septa with uh, generally clear alveoli. Common causes of viral pneumonia include influenza A and B, respiratory syncytial virus, human metapneumovirus, parainfluenza virus and adenovirus. Nasocomial or hospital-acquired pneumonias are defined as pulmonary infections acquired in the course of a hospital stay. These infections not only have an adverse impact on the clinical course of ill patients, but also add considerably to the burgeoning cost of healthcare. Nasocomial infections are common in hospitalized individuals with severe underlying disease, those who are immunosuppressed or those of, on prolonged antibiotic regimens. Patients on mechanical ventilation are a particularly high-risk group and infections acquired in the setting are given the designation ventilator-associated pneumonia. Gram-negative frauds uh, and uh, Staphylococcus aureus are the most common isolates. Unlike community-acquired pneumonias, Staphylococcus pneumonia is not a common pathogen in the hospital setting. Aspiration pneumonia occurs in debilitated patients or those who aspirate gastric contents while unconscious, for example, when they are after stroke or during repeated vomiting. Those affected have abnormal gag and swallowing reflexes that facilitate aspiration. The resultant pneumonia is partly chemical due to the extremely irritating effects of the gastric acid and partially bacterial. Typically, more than one organism is recovered on culture, aerobes being more common than anaerobes. Aspiration pneumonia is often necrotized and pursues a fulminant clinical course and is a frequent cause of death in the individuals predisposed to aspiration. In those who survive, abscess formation is a common complication. Microaspiration, by contrast, occurs in many individuals, especially those with gastroesophageal reflux and may exacerbate other lung diseases but does not lead to pneumonia. Candida albicans is the most common disease-causing fungus. It is a normal inhabitant of the oral cavity, gastrointestinal tract and vagina in many individuals. Systemic candidiasis with associated pneumonia is a disease restricted to immunocompromised patients that has protein manifestations. In tissue sections, candida albicans demonstrate yeast-like forms pseudohyphae and true hyphae, or as shown on the picture on the left. Pseudohyphae are an important diagnostic clue and represent budding yeast cells joined end-to-end -end at constrictions, thus simulating true fungal hyphae. The organisms may be visible with routine um, hemoglobin um, HND stains, but a variety of special fungal stains commonly are used to be better to, to better highlight the pathogens. Candidiasis can involve the mucous membranes, skin, and deep organisms. Among these varied presentations, the following merit brief mention. Superficial infection on mucosal surfaces of the oral cavity. This is the most common presentation. Florid proliferation of the fungi creates gray white, dirty looking pseudomembranes composed of matted organisms and inflammatory cells and tissues debris. Deep to the surface, there is mucosal hyperemia and inflammation. Fresh is seen in newborns, debilitated patients and children receiving oral corticosteroids for asthma. And after a course of broad-spectrum antibiotics that destroy complete, competing normal bacterial flora. 
The other major risk group includes HIV-positive patients, patients with oral fresh not associated with an obvious underlying condition, should be evaluated for HIV infection. Vaginitis is extremely common in women, especially those who are diabetic or pregnant on oral, on oral contraceptive pills. Esophagitis is a common in patients with AIDS and in those with hematolymphoid malignancies. These patients present with dysphagia, painful swallowing and retrosternal pain. Endoscopy demonstrates white plaques and pseudomembranes resembling those found on the mucosal surfaces. Skin infection can manifest in many different forms it's shown on the picture, including infection of the nail, nail folds, hair follicles, moist intertriginous skin such as armpits or webs of the fingers and toes, and penile skin. Diaperage is a cutaneous candidal infection seen in the perineum of infants in the region of contact with wet diapers. Chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, as shown on the picture, is a chronic refractory disease afflicting the mucous membranes, skin, hair and nails. It is associated with a variety of underlying T-cell defects. These in include Job syndrome, an inherited condition with a variety of abnormalities, including a defect in um, Th17 T cell responses, which are important in controlling fungal infections. Invasive candidiasis implies blood borne dissemination of organisms to various tissues or organs. Common patterns include renal abscess, myocardial abscess, and endocarditis. Brain involvement, most commonly meningitis, but parenchymal microabscesses occur. Endophthalmitis, virtually any eye structure can be involved. Hep hepatic abscesses and candida pneumonia, usually presenting with bilateral nodular infiltrates, resembling pneumocystis pneumonia. Patients with acute leukemias who are profoundly neutropenic after chemotherapy are particularly prone to the development of systemic disease. Candida endocarditis is the most common fungal endocarditis, usually occurring in patients with prosthetic heart valves or in intravenous, intravenous drug abuses. Cryptococcosis caused by the cryptococcus neoformans almost exclusively manifests as an opportunistic infection in immunocompromised hosts, particularly patients with AIDS or hematolymphoid malignancies. The fungus is a yeast, has a thick gelatinous capsule and reproduces by beading, budding. Unlike in candida infections, however, pseudohyphal or true hyphal forms are not seen. Identification of the capsule is a key diagnostic clue. In routine um, uh, HND stain, the capsule is not directly visible, but often a clear halo, as shown on the picture, representing the area occupied by the capsule can be surround seen surrounding the individual fungi. India ink or periodic acid sheath staining effectively highlights the fungus. The capsule of polysaccharide antigen is the substrate for the cryptococcal latex agglutination assay, which is positive in more than 95% of patients infected with the organism. Cryptococcus uh, is usually manifest as pulmonary as on the left picture, the central nervous system as on the right, or disseminated disease. Cryptococcus is most likely to be acquired by inhalation of aerosolized uh, contaminated soil or bird droppings. The fungus initially localizes in the lungs and then disseminates to other sites, particularly the meninges. 
sites of involvement are marked by a variable tissue response which ranges from florid proliferation of gelatinous organisms with a minimal or absent inflammatory cell infiltrate to a granulomatous reaction. In the central nervous system, these fungi grow in gelatinous masses within the meninges or expand the perivascular Virchow-Robin spaces producing so-called soap bubble lesions. The discovery of the association of Helicobacter pylori with peptic ulcer disease revolutionized the understanding of chronic gastritis. These spiral-shaped or curved bacilli are present in gastric biopsy specimens from almost all patients with duodenal ulcers and the majority of those with gastric ulcers or chronic gastritis. Acute helicobacter pylori infection is subclinical in most cases, rather it is the chronic gastritis that ultimately brings the afflicted person to medical attention. Helicobacter pylori infection most often presents as an antral gastritis with increased acid production. The increased acid production may give rise to peptic ulcer disease of the duodenum or stomach. While in most cases helicobacter pylori gastritis is limited to the antrum, in some individuals it progresses to involve the gastric body in fundus, resulting in reduced parietal cell mass and acid secretion. Reduced acid output results in hypergastrinemia, as in autoimmune atrophic gastritis. In addition, extension of the gastritis to the gastric body and fundus results in intestinal metaplasia and increased risk of gastric cancer. Helicobacter pylori infection is associated with poverty, household crowding, limited education, residents in areas with poor sanitation and birth outside of the United States. Infection is typically acquired in childhood and may then persist for life. Improved sanitation in many areas likely explains why helicobacter pylori infection rates among younger individuals today are markedly lower than they were in similarly aged individuals 30 years ago. In the United States, the prevalence of helicobacter pylori infection is also high in African Americans and Mexican Americans. Worldwide, colonization rates vary from less than 10% to more than 80 as a function of age, geography and social factors. Helicobacter pylori organisms have adapted to the ecologic niche provided by gastric mucus. Although Helicobacter pylori may invade the gastric mucosa, the contribution of invasion to disease pathogenesis is not known. Four features are linked to Helicobacter pylori virulence. Flagella, which allow the bacteria to be motile in viscous mucus. Ureas, which generates ammonia from endogenous urea, thereby elevating local gastric pH around the organisms and protecting the bacteria from the acidic pH of the stomach. Adhesins, which enhance bacterial adherence to surface for veolar cells. Toxins such as that encoded by a cytotoxin-associated gene A that may be involved in ulcer cancer development. These factors allow helicobacter pylori to create an imbalance between gastroduodenal mucosal defenses and damaging forces that overcome those defenses. Gastric biopsy specimens generally demonstrate helicobacter pylori in infected individuals. The organism is concentrated within mucous overlying epithelial cells in the surface and neck regions. The inflammatory reactions include includes a variable number of neutrophils within the lamina propria, including some that cross the basement membrane to assume an intraepithelial location and accumulate in the lumen of gastric pits to create pit abscesses. The superficial lamina propria includes large numbers of plasma cells, often in clusters or sheets, as well as increased numbers of lymphocytes and macrophages. When intense inflammatory infiltrates may create thickened rugal folds, mimicking infiltrative lesions. 
Nymphoid aggregates, some with germinal symptoms, are frequently present and represent an induced form of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue that has a potential to transform into lymphoma. Intestinal metaplasia, characterized by the presence of goblet cells and columnar absorptive cells, also may be present and is associated with increased risk of gastric adenocarcinoma. Helicobacter pylori shows tropism for gastric foveolar epithelium and generally is not found in the areas of intestinal, um, intestinal metaplasia, acid-producing mucosa of the gastric body or duodenal epithelium. Antral biopsies are therefore preferred for evaluation of helicobacter pylori gastritis. In addition to histologic identification of the organism, several diagnostic tests have been developed, including a non-invasive serologic test for anti-helicobacter pylori antibodies, a stool test for the organism, and the urea breath test based on the generation of ammonia by bacterial ureas. Gastric biopsy specimens also can be analyzed by the rapid urea test, bacterial culture, or polymerase chain reaction, PCR assay for bacterial DNA. Effective treatments include combinations of antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors. Patients with Helicobacter pylori gastritis usually improve after treatment, although relapses can follow in complete eradication or infection. This global, um, the global burden of infection diseases in, results in 1 million deaths annually and greater than 10% of all deaths in patients younger than 5 years of age worldwide. Enterocolitis presents with a broader range of signs uh, and symptoms, including diarrhea, abdominal pain, urgency, perianal discomfort, incontinence, and hemorrhage. Bacterial infections such as enterotoxigenic Escherichia coli are frequently responsible, but the most common pathogens vary with age, nutrition, and host immune status, as well as environment. For example, epidemics of cholera are common in areas with poor sanitation as a result of inadequate public health measures or as a consequence of natural disaster or war. Pediatric infectious diarrhea, which may result in severe dehydration and metabolic acidosis, is commonly caused by enteric viruses. Vibrio cholera organisms are coma-shaped uh, gram-negative bacteria that cause cholera, a disease that has been endemic in the Ganges Valley of India and Bangladesh for all recorded history. Vibrio cholera is transmitted primarily by contaminated drinking water. However, it can also be present in food and causes rare cases of seafood-associated disease. There is a marked Seasonal variation in most locales due to rapid growth of fibro bacteria at warm temperatures. The only animal reservoirs are shellfish and plankton. Vibrio organisms um, are non-invasive but cause disease by producing a toxin that interferes with the absorptive function of enterocytes. Flagellar proteins, which are involved in motility and detachment, are necessary for efficient bacterial colonization and the secreted metalloproteinase that also has hemagglutinin activity is important for bacterial detachment and shedding in the stool. However, it is the performed, uh, preformed enterotoxin, cholerotoxin, which causes disease. The toxin, which is composed of five B subunits that direct endocytosis and a single active A subunit, is delivered to the endoplasmic reticulum by retrograde transport. A fragment of the A subunit is transported from the endoplasmic reticulum lumen into the cytosol, where it interacts with cytosolic adenosine diphosphate ribosylation factors to ribosylate and activate the G-protein uh, GS-alpha. 
This stimulates adenylate uh, cyclase uh, and resulting increases um, and resulting increases in intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate open in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, which releases chloride ions into the lumen. This creates an osmotic gradient that draws water into the lumen, leading to massive secretory diarrhea. Remarkably, mucosal biopsy specimens show only minimal morphologic alterations. Most exposed individuals are asymptomatic or suffer only mild diarrhea. Those with severe disease have an abrupt onset of watery diarrhea and vomiting after an incubation period of one to five days. The volume of diarrhea may reach one liter per hour, leading to dehydration, hypertension, electrolyte imbalances, muscular cramping, anuria, shock, loss of consciousness, and death. Most deaths occur within the first 24 hours of presentation. Although the mortality rate for severe cholera is 50 to 70 percent, without treatment, fluid replacement can save more than 99 percent of patients. A multitude of organisms can infect the liver and biliary tree, including bacteria, fungi, helminths, and other parasites and protozoa. Infectious organisms can reach the liver through several pathways. Ascending infection via the gut and biliary tract, vascular seeding, most often through the portal system via the gastrointestinal tract, direct invasion from an adjacent source, and penetrating injury. Bacteria that may establish an infection uh, in the liver via the blood include Staphylococcus aureus, intoxic um, shock syndrome, Salmonella, TP, typhoid fever, and Trypanema pallidum in secondary or tertiary syphilis. Ascending infections are most common in the setting of partial or complete biliary tract obstruction and are typically caused by gut flora which may colonize the static bile in the ducts. Whatever the source of the bacteria, this pyogenic organism intrahepatic abscesses may develop, producing fever, right upper quadrant pain, and tender hepatomegaly. Through antibiotic therapy, um, although antibiotic therapy may sterilize small abscesses, surgical drainage is often necessary for larger lesions. More commonly, extrahepatic bacterial infections, particularly sepsis, induce mild hepatic inflammation, shown on the left picture by the arrow, and varying degrees of hepatocellular cholestasis, indirectly shown on the right picture, without establishing an infectious needles in the liver. Other non-viral infectious agents cause liver disease with important or unusual pathogenic features that merit specific comment. These include the following. Schistosomiasis, most commonly found in Asia, Africa, and South America, is one of the most common causes of non serotic portal hypertension worldwide. Adult worms in the gut produce numerous eggs, some of which find their way into portal circulation, where they lodge and induce a granulomatose reaction, shown on the picture, which is associated with marked fibrosis. And amoeba histolytica, an important cause of dysentery, sometimes ascends to the liver through portal circulation and produces secondary fossa of infection that can progress to large necrotic areas called amoebic liver abscesses, shown on the picture by the arrows. Amoebic abscesses are more common in the right lobe of the liver. The abscess cavity contains necrotic liver cells, but unlike pyogenic abscesses, neutrophils are absent. Liver fluke infection, most common in Southeast Asia, is associated with a high rate of cholangiocarcinoma. Responsible organisms include Fasciola hepatica on the left picture, Opistorsis species um, on, in the middle, and uh, Clonorchis sinensis on the picture on the right. Sexually transmitted diseases have complicated human existence for centuries. Globally, approximately 15 million new cases of STDs occur every year. 
on this 4 million affect 15 to 19 year olds and 6 million affect 20 to 24 year olds, women are far more likely to become infected by sexually transmitted diseases and to be asymptomatic. Of the 10 leading infectious diseases that require notification of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, five, chlamydial infection, gonorrhea, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, syphilis, and hepatitis B are sexually transmitted diseases. In the United States, uh, the two most commonly uh, sexually transmitted diseases are genital herpes and genital herpes papilloma virus infection but these do not require CDC notification. Several of these entities, such as human, efficiency, uh, human immunodeficiency virus uh, infection, HPV infection, hepatitis B and syphilis, we will, we will discuss during uh, the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.